coming to you from Lagos. This beautiful gospel, our time that you've been expecting. I want to thank you. You are the reason why we are here. When we know that people are waiting to hear from us, we are eager to speak to you, particularly as it concerns the word of life. And today we are going to hear something very special, special in so many ways, more so when it has been misconstrued and misunderstood and misapplied in many circles. But by the grace of God today, we will hear something the way it is in the Bible, as raw as it ought to be. I have the privilege to discuss with you a topic, life in the spirit. But before then, let's share a word of prayer and then go on. Dear Holy Spirit, we want to thank you this moment. You are the author of all knowledge. You are the Godhead that is in this dispensation. Therefore, this day I make myself available to minister grace to everyone that hears me live now and everyone that may hear me after, even as we put it through the channels that are available, Facebook or any other way. Once more, we thank you. I receive function to minister grace to my hearers now and everyone that will hear me after. Thank you for the time we're going to spend in your presence. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Life in the Spirit. I'm sure you know that every human being is a tripartite being. Well, if you do not know, know it today that you are a tripartite being. You are a spirit being with a soul living in a body. The body is a physical expression that we call you. But the real you is the spirit man in you. So you are a spirit being with a soul living in a body. But interestingly, the physical expression is what we know you to be. If you want to say, I know C.S. Yanyamu, you are simply saying, I know the human entity and the expression in the body that is called C.S. Yanyamu. But interestingly, C.S. Yanyamu is beyond the physical you can see. And then our behavior manifests and shows who we are. So what does it mean to live in the spirit? What does it mean to live our life in the spirit? Have you been living in the spirit? We need to live and walk in the spirit if we must make a success of the life we have come here to live. I want us to read a scripture as foundational and I will be explaining from these scriptures. Stand fast, therefore. This is Paul writing to the church that is in Galatia. The epistle of Paul to the Galatian church. Chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 1 because it's foundational to the story and the discussion we're going to have. Paul wrote to the Galatians and said, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to the whole law. Christ has become no, of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything or uncircumcision. But faith, which worketh by love, ye run well. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded. For he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment. Whosoever be, and I brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would that they were even cut off, which trouble you. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. I want you to note it have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion for the flesh. But by love, serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, 
thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed of one another. This I say, walk in the spirit, and that's where we are getting this topic from. Walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusted against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if you be led of the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, rot, strife, sedition, heresies, envying, murders, drunkenness, reveling, and such as of which I tell you before, and I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law, and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affection and lust. If we live in spirit, let us also walk in spirit. I want you to note it again and I'm repeating it. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let's not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Beautiful treatise from Apostle Paul to the church in Galatia. I hope you have been following our teaching. If you have, we have told us in this meeting some time ago that the Bible is broadly divided into three. The law and the prophets, the gospel, and of course the epistles. The book of Revelation stands out separately because it's a book of yesterday and today. But I'm interested in the epistle. Epistle is letter, another word for epistle. And Paul wrote to the churches that they established, trying to correct the anomalies that existed, that came up as they have left the churches to go and plant other churches. They often get wind of what is going on in those churches that they planted, and each time they get something, they write to them, or he goes there himself, or he even writes and goes there. But in this case, the matter was very simple. Father Abraham had injunction, if you like, covenant from God, to circumcise every male child born to the Jews, his own descendants, on the eighth day as a sign of covenant with them. It remained the law and they were doing it. But it was only a symbol of something yet to come. And that something was the coming of Jesus Christ himself. And then the circumcision of the first king of our hearts. It was the circumcision of the male organ that was a, a symbol. I hope you also know that the Old Testament is a symbol while the substance is the New Testament. The Old Testament cannot contradict the New or either. So if you understand how the Bible is, there was a symbol and there is a substance. They are one. They are two sides of the same coin. And in this case, the symbol in the Old Testament was the circumcision of the first king of, the every, of every male child that was born to the Jews. But when Jesus came, what is needed is a circumcision of our heart. You had a heart of, a heart of stone as an unbeliever, and every unbeliever has a heart of stone. It's insensitive to things of God. Every heart of stone is insensitive to things of God. Every heart, every every uh, unbeliever's heart that is a stone of a heart of stone swims and lives in sin and doesn't blink an eye. But the moment you become born again, the first king of your heart is circumcised. Taking away the first king makes your heart sensitive to things of God and of God. Now, what happened in the Old Testament, the first king of the male organ, when you remove it, you expose the sensitive and tender part of it. Have you seen an uncircumcised penis before? If you have not seen, when you see one, you see that there's a lot of things clogging around it. It doesn't look neat. 
and it's insensitive till it pulls down, pulls back. That's the like, that is the symbol of that test of that. Now, what happened was that when Jesus died and salvation came, grace followed. There were Jews who were still glorying in the advantage they had as children of descendants of Abraham and with the covenant. They went to tell the church that is not in Jerusalem, the church of the Gentiles, look, you need to be circumcised for you to become a Christian. That is the only way you can become a child of God. If you are not circumcised, you cannot become a child of God. That was heresy. That was not true. Whether they knew what they were saying or not, but Paul needed to write. This is the letter he wrote to the church in Galatia and telling them, look, this circumcision thing is not relevant in this dispensation now. There is a new circumcision of the heart of every believer. Therefore, whether you are circumcised or not, what matters is that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and his atoning grace on the cross of Calvary. That is the background to the story. Now, the important thing here is that it says there is a liberty in the spirit. And we are talking about life in the spirit. What is life in the spirit like? This is a life that is connected to the Lord, to his maker. The spirit, I hope you know also, that controls the physical. It is the spiritual part that controls the physical. What you see here physically existed in the spirit, in the spirit realm, and then became part of the physical that we live. So if you are in control of the spirit, your life in the spirit, you are in control of the life in the physical. Now, the part, the part I emphasized on and I ask you to wait is if you live in the spirit, also walk in the spirit. I repeat it. If you live in the spirit, also walk in the spirit. Living and walking are different. This walking is not W-O-R-U-K alone. It's also walk as W-L-K. The emphasis here is W-L-K. Walking in the spirit is that every aspect of your life, your business life is in the spirit. You don't live the life in the spirit in your house or in the church when you come. You need to walk in the spirit at each point. Living in the spirit may be easier. So they thought, but I want you to know that anything that is done without faith is a sin. In a particular organization opened monastery and felt that when they keep man there, away from sin and the sinful world and pictures that we see, that the person will become holy. But that's not true. Holiness is not about only what you see. But the truth is, if you live in the spirit, you need to walk in the spirit. That's to say, at no time should you leave God behind in all you do, whether in your house sleeping, as a father, or as a businessman that I am, you must walk in the spirit. The walk and life, living in the spirit are two different things because a lot of people could live in the spirit, manage to live in the spirit, but they don't walk in the spirit. They don't, when they get into the business place, they wear the toga of the businessman and they, they, they bring out an eye that is supposed to be used for business. This Bible says, no, it is wrong. If you live in the spirit, you must walk in the spirit. I operate in the marketplace. I know what it is, what it means to operate in the marketplace. I know that a lot of my colleagues will compromise their position. There are certain professions that if you don't join them, you can't operate in it. But a child of God must live in the spirit and walk in the spirit. That's what Paul wrote to them. What am I saying? I'm saying that you are not supposed to only live in the spirit without walking in the spirit. When you take a walk outside your house for anything, you are now walking out of your house. You need to walk in the spirit even there. There is no division, there is no dichotomy in the life of a child of God that lives in the spirit, that walks in the spirit. So, now I will read one or two more scriptures and I will be rounding it up. The law of grace. Galatians 5, 1 to 6, and I have explained to you. I've explained to you each and every one of them. Now, let me give you an interesting aspect of this walking in the Spirit. I'm going to read it from John's Gospel. John's Gospel. And John's Gospel, 
21:18 and I will explain it from there Verily verily I say unto you when thou was young thou guidest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest but when thou shalt be old thou shalt stretch forth thy hand and another shall guide thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not Oh how I wish I can make it simpler but I'll try King James Bible is peculiar. I still love it. But if you read it in a simpler edition, you will understand. But I will, don't worry about that. I will explain to you. When you were young, you could go to wherever you want to go. But when you become old, you will raise your hand to go and you cannot go. It doesn't mean that you are becoming incapacitated. But let me tell you, it is a matured mind that is not doing safe will. I thought it would have been opposite. I thought it would have been when you were young, your parents will control you, you have restrictions, and then you cannot do whatever you want to do. And then when you become matured like me, you can now do whatever you like to do. But the Bible says it's not true. Understand me. I had parents that were very loving or disciplined in so many ways. Growing up in my father's house, they gave me rules of things to do and things not to do. Let me recount some of the rules. Rule number one says, of no account should you leave the four walls of this house when it is six o'clock in the evening. And wherever you are, when it's six o'clock, you must be finding your way back to the house. Rule number one. Rule number two. On no account should you leave this house without telling anybody, no matter who, where you're going. We don't want to come back to the house and they say, we don't know where you have gone. That was an important rule to me. And I love to sneak out because some of the things I did were not things you take permission to do. Nobody gives you permission for them. So I will sneak out of the house. And when I get back, I get beaten for doing that. Rule number one was a big rule for me. But do you know I live now as a man of the house? I am the head of my family by the special grace of God. Do you know I can walk out of my house without telling anybody? And nobody will have the guts to ask me, where are you going? But the rules of my father that I grew up with, constrains me to tell everybody including the house girl in the house I'm going to so so and so place now have you seen the difference it's a matured man a matured man the spiritual man that puts control on himself by allowing the Holy Spirit to take control it is the boy who have not grown that wants to go to everywhere and goes to everywhere without restriction that is what life in the spirit is if you are living in the spirit, you ask questions each time there is a matter. I'll give you some instances. In the process of establishing a stockbroking firm, I needed to get partners, if you like, directors around me. And I had a choice of people who wanted to join me in the company. When I prayed, I didn't get a direct yes answer or no. Don't take this person. Don't take this kind of person. Particularly as it has to do with unequally yoking with unbelievers. And I had to go to a senior friend of mine and I, share, I said to him, this is the situation I'm facing. My chairman is of this faith. These directors are of this faith. And the Bible says about do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. So what do I do? And I received fatherly and godly counsel from this elderly man. That is it. I could have done it myself and done anything I want to do. But for every step you take as a child of God living in the spirit, seek counsel. If you didn't get a direct answer from the scripture and you needed the answer from a matured Christian better than you, that's living in the spirit. And of course, young men, they are this when they want to marry. Oh, that is the most important part. They will pray. They will ask you to join them in prayers. As if that is when it matters most to you. Yes, I agree with you that the choice of a life partner is very important. It could derail a man. It could make a man prosperous. It can, it can take you to hell. 
if you ever get into a wrong union, I agree completely that it's important that you, 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 you must have to pray through. But God is interested in all you do, not just in marriage. Oh, I didn't know that God is interested in the dress I wear. One day I wore a dress and the Spirit said to me, no, you can't wear this dress again. I packed it up, gave it out immediately. God is interested in things you go out with on a daily basis. I'm talking about the spiritual man. I'm not talking about anybody who lives his life anyhow. You can get up in the morning and get dressed and eat whatever you like and move. God is interested in what you do. I will not forget the day I dressed to leave my house. And I had it clearly, the Spirit said to me, go and change this suit. And I looked at the suit. It wasn't one of my best suits. It was one of those, you know, because of my profession, I wear suits five times in a week. And it wasn't one of them that is neat. And the Spirit insisted that I should go and change it. And I went in and changed it grudgingly. I was saying, what is this? Got to the office only to discover that an important appointment that I've been waiting for, the letter was waiting for me. And I dare not go to that appointment with any house suit because you are dressed the way you dress. People said it. And the Holy Spirit helped me in that matter. I can call so many times, so many times that the Holy Spirit had come to my head. So living your life in the Spirit requires that the Holy Spirit is in control. Never will you be in control as to do your own things. And of course he speaks. Some other times, you know, the songwriter made it beautiful for me. He said, when darkness seemed to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging word. That's the recipe. Because it's not every time that you want an answer that you get from God. God is sovereign. It's not your house boy that he must answer you. But when he is silent, he has given you where to rest. His unchanging word, the scripture. So each, each time that the Lord didn't speak expressly, look for the Bible portion where the same matter is handled in the spirit and you can handle it. So life in the spirit is a life of liberty. It's not a life regulated by all kinds of law. But again, you must know that it is not a situation of lawlessness. No, no, it's not. It's not a lawless situation. I just explained to you what my life was growing up in my father's house with all the restrictions. And today, I am free. I can afford to leave my house and go out for one week. And I come back. If you ask me, I tell you that I'm a man of the house. I have authority over everybody, including you. But I wouldn't do that. I dare not do that. Am I under uh, forced not to do it? No. But the Spirit of God in me, because I'm a man of the Spirit, will not let me do that. So life in the spirit, it's a beautiful life. It directs your step. It takes you off. Sometimes when he decides not to talk to you, he takes you off. Let me tell you what my typical day looks like. Maybe I'll close with that. I get up in the morning. I don't get up my bed immediately. I look through my days in the eye of the spirit. How would it be like? Where am I going? Where should I go? And I organized my, 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 my day in my head. And then I prayed my prayer. Then come out for the morning devotion. In my family, we pray every morning. We sing every morning. And when I'm done with that, people that need to go faster. These days, I don't leave the house very early. Because I do some work at home. And I take my shower. Each and every one of them had spiritual backing. And I leave my house. When I get out, my car is ready. My driver is ready. And I enter. I have prayed over his head, committed him to the hand of God. And the day is going to be smooth. As we enter to move, if the Spirit says to me, to, to me, don't go that direction, take so so and so direction, I'll tell him, we are not going through that way. Let's go through this place. If the spirit didn't speak, I have prayed over his head, I leave it in his hand. That's my day. And we get to where we are going. Every moment I'm alert and I want to be alert. That's what we call life in the spirit. And God himself orders your step at each point. Sometimes 
he intervenes. Some other times he leaves you. But when he leaves you, he has dropped enough word into you. I'm talking practical things. And everything we do, we get cleared. We don't do things by our own volition. No, we don't. Even the arms we give, it is by the leading of the Spirit. So life in the Spirit is a life fully yielded to God, your maker. And it is for them who live in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit. There is no two lives to live. In the Spirit and out of the Spirit, no. If you do that, you have brought a dichotomy into your life. But if you must walk in the Spirit, the first step is to give your life to Jesus. And when you do, he begins to order your step at each point. Begins to speak to you. Begins to speak to you. If the, it, it's a very big danger if you live in the Spirit and don't walk in the Spirit. I repeat it. The way to walk in the Spirit is to first give your life to Jesus. Those decisions have been taken by the rule of the tongue. The Holy Spirit to guide you and take it from for you. Have you imagined, for instance, what you did in a dream that you would have thought you shouldn't have done? It's because you are not in you are not in control of your spiritual life. If you are in control of your spiritual life, what you do, what you can do in the day, you will not do it in the dream. Oh yes, and I know it. Uh, let me share. Maybe this will close it eventually before I make the altar call. A young lady told me the story of how the husband died. The husband was sick and very sick, but kept on confessing life till one day, in the dream with that same husband, they took him away from her in that dream, and she could see them put a chain on his neck and took him, took him away from her. She couldn't intervene. She woke up in the morning and realized that she has lost the husband. And of course, the husband died months later. Reason was, she wasn't in control of her spiritual life as to intervene, even in that dream. It takes people in control of your life, living and walking, to intervene in a situation like that. It is possible that when you wake up and cry unto the Lord and pray, you can recover lost ground in the dream. But there's nothing as beautiful as winning it in the dream, winning it in the spiritual battle. Then when you come out physically, it's already done. That's what I mean. So if you live in the spirit, you must learn to walk in the spirit. The beginning is to give your life to Jesus and receive him. Have Holy Spirit baptism and he indwells you and orders you every now and then to do. That privilege is given to you now, those of you that are watching me on the screen. If you want to give your life to Jesus, put your right hand on your chest. If you have done that, please take the first two minutes, two seconds, and say to the God, I'm sorry. If indeed you are sorry, you have lived your life by your own defects. You have been doing your own things by your own way. As if nobody created you, as if you created yourself. You didn't know that the Bible is a guide to living. And you have lived in that way. If indeed you are sorry, say, I'm sorry unto the Lord. And I would like to pray with you if you have done that. Father, thank you for everyone who hears me, who is hearing me now. Who have realized that they have lived their life in the spirit without walking in the spirit. Maybe because they haven't given their life to Jesus and today they want to give their life. I pray that you remove their names from the book of death into the book of life. Henceforth, 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 when they move, you are with them. At each point, in dream, in life, in reality, as they walk in the business place, you are with them. You will not lead them into temptation, you lead them away from all level. Not even strangers will find them, because you will be on, on with them at each time. Once more, I thank you. In Jesus Christ's name, I pray. Amen. If you pray that prayer, our social media handles are on the screen. Write us. Call us. We are interested to hear you. Thank you for doing that. If you don't mind, anybody that cares to hear telling you are born again, if the person wants to know when you became born again, quote the date of today. That's the day you became born again. And you can afford to tell everybody that you belong to the family of God. 
once more cheers for so doing see you next sunday by his grace in jesus name amen